Hey, welcome back to Cool Classics. Today we're going to be taking a look at the life and career of Ernest Borgnine, born Hermes Efron Borgnino, January 24th, 1917. He was born in Hamden, Connecticut, and his parents were Italian immigrants. His family moved to New Haven, Connecticut, where he graduated from James Hill House High School, where he only played sports and showed no interest in acting. After graduation, he joined the United States Navy in October of 1935. He served aboard the destroyer minesweeper USS Lamberton. He was honorably discharged from the Navy in October of 1941, but in January of 1942 he re-enlisted after the attacks on Pearl Harbor. During World War II he patrolled the Atlantic coast on an anti-submarine warfare ship, the USS Sylph. In September of 1945 he was honorably discharged from the Navy after serving almost 10 years. During his service, he obtained the grade of Gunner's Mate First Class. His military awards include the Navy Good Conduct Medal, the American Defense Service Medal, the American Campaign Medal, and World War II Victory Medal. Later in 1997, he received the United States Navy Memorial Lone Sailor Award. The Lone Sailor Award is given to sea service veterans who have excelled and distinguished themselves by drawing upon their military experience to become better successful in their subsequent careers and lives, while exemplifying the core values of honor, courage, and commitment. Now after his discharge from the Navy, he moved back home to Connecticut with his parents. He said for a couple weeks they were patting him on the back, telling him how proud they were of him and that he did a great job. Then it's turned into more like, so what are you going to do with your life now? which he realized really meant, so when are you going to go get a job? So he went out and got a job in a factory, which made his dad real happy, but he said he was bored every day just doing the same thing over and over. And one evening he was talking to his mom at the kitchen table and said this to her, and she said, well, you know, you've always liked making a fool out of yourself in front of other people, so why don't you figure out how to make some money at that? And she laughed, and he goes, hmm, maybe I could be an actor. And she goes, that's it, you could go be an actor. And he said, who would have thought 10 years from that day? I was being handed an Academy Award from Grace Kelly. So he went ahead and enrolled at the Randall School of Drama in Hartford, Connecticut. And after a while, that's all he wanted to do was act. So he went ahead and moved to Virginia to become a member of the Barter Theater in Abington. Now his father was like, hey, I don't know if this is such a great idea, but good luck, son. And his mother was like, this sounds good to me. Now after Virginia, he moved to New York, and there he was appearing in plays and got to be on television for the first time. And he says that back then, television was live TV, so you had your allotted time slot, and they would just cut away to the next show when it was done. So everything had to be really worked out carefully, and you were on a schedule. And he said three times one week, they ran too long, and the audience didn't get to see the end of the show. And the director got mad and said, you guys are on your own tomorrow. And he didn't show up. And so they were like, oh, man, we got to do this great. And so they went ahead and started rushing through it. And they ended up three minutes early and had all this dead time. Now, after doing this for a couple years, he started to notice a change in the industry. It seemed Hollywood was trying to take over the television part of it all. Now, the people back in New York just dismissed this. They said, no, it's never going to happen. There's no way that they can record and edit and put up a show every day. It's always going to be live. It has to be that way. And he thought, well, either way, I'm going to go out to Hollywood and check things out. Now, once he got to Hollywood, he started auditioning for movies, but he really wasn't having a whole lot of luck at first. And he was down at Sunset and Vine walking around one night, and he thought, wow, look at all these people. I wonder if someday I'll be famous enough that even one of them will recognize me. He says it wasn't long after that he started to get some smaller roles in movies. In 1951, he appeared in China Course Air, then The Whistle at Eaton Falls, and The Mob. And in 1952, he didn't really find any work. But in 1953, he appeared in Treasure of the Golden Condor, The Stranger Wore a Gun, and then From Here to Eternity. Now, he was already concerned at this point because so far he's only been picked to play bad guys. But after reading the From Here to Eternity script, he was like, oh my God, this is the worst one ever. I'm a real SOB in this movie. <laughs> so he said, I went for it. I went all out. He said, I must have did a really good job, too, because one night I was heading out to get a pizza, and I pull up at this place on Ventura. I go in, pick up the pizza, and I put it on my passenger seat, and I go ahead and make a U-turn so I can go back up the road, back to where I was staying. As soon as I complete the U-turn, a cop pulls me right over. 
and he comes walking up to the window and he asks for my ID and he sees it and he looks back at me and looks at the ID and he yells back to his partner and says, hey, I caught the guy who killed Frank Sinatra. <laughs> and Ernest laughs and goes, oh, you seen the movie, huh? And he says, yeah, I don't like you. And they went back to the car and wrote him a ticket. <laughs> he said, so I finally got recognized in Hollywood by a cop for killing Frank Sinatra. Now, the next year, 1954, he was in four movies. The last one was called Vera Cruz, and it's just loaded with people. Gary Cooper, Burt Lancaster, <laughs> Cesar Romero, Charles Bronson. And um, after the filming was done, the producers and directors were talking with some other ones, and they recommended him for a part in a new movie called Marty. They were like, you got to be kidding me. The guy that killed Frank Sinatra, <laughs> he's a bad guy. He can't play this part. And the guy said, no, man, give him a shot. He can do this. So they go ahead and call Ernie, and he's like, absolutely, I'd love to do this. So they tell him, well, we're going to send you out the script, but we want to audition you next week. And he said, I'm on location right now filming A Bad Day at Black Rock. And they said, that's not a problem. We will show up there. How about next Tuesday? And he's like, um, okay. Ernie was nervous because this would be his first lead role, and so he told Spencer Tracy, and Spencer said, don't worry about it, kid. I'm going to make sure that you get off early that day so that you don't keep him waiting. You go in there and knock it out of the park. So when they showed up, he was let loose early, and he went and met the producer and director, and they went in a trailer, and they said, we're going to play the parts of everyone else, and you're just going to be Marty, and we're just going to keep reading these lines, and we're going to go through it all and see how it goes. He's like, I'm ready. And so they broke into it, and he started to have this Western twang to his voice. And they're like, wait, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, man, because he literally just walked off the set. He said, I have a three-day you know, growth of beard on me. Um, I'm kind of sweaty and dirty. I'm wearing Western clothes, cowboy boots, and a hat. And I go, okay, let me compose myself. So I ran to the bathroom and I washed my face and took off that shirt and just put on like a t-shirt <laughs> and went back in there and said, all right, let's start again. He says when they started the audition again, he could tell that they were a little iffy on him. They were like not warming up to him so good. And as it went on, it started to loosen up and he got into character. And by the time he got to the part with his mother, that things really opened up and became emotional. And when his mother says, Marty, why don't you just go put on a suit and go down to the dance hall? I'm sure you can find a girlfriend. And he goes, Mom, don't you get it? I'm just an ugly, ugly man. No girl will want me. And he said he started crying. And, and next thing you know, he looked over and they had tears in their eyes and the guy was crying and playing his mother's part. And they go, you're in. The next morning when they were back on set, Spencer Tracy came up and asked, well, kid, how did it go? And he said, I got it, I got it, sir. I'm gonna be the lead in a movie. And he goes, and you're gonna be great. And little did anybody know, the very next year, he beat Spencer Tracy for the Academy Award, along with James Dean, Frank Sinatra for The Man with the Golden Arm, James Cagney for Love Me or Leave Me. And he said, that role, that movie, changed my life. Blue suit, gray suit. I'm just a fat little man, a fat, ugly man. You're not ugly. I'm ugly, I'm ugly, I'm ugly. Marty. Ma, leave me alone. Ma, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? I'm miserable enough as it is. All right, so I'll go to the Stardust Ball, Ma. I'll put on a blue suit and I'll go. And you know what I'm going to get for my trouble? Heartache. A big night of heartache. The nominees for Best Actor are Ernest Borgnine in Marty, James Cagney in Love Me or Leave Me, James Dean in East of Eden, Frank Sinatra in The Man with the Golden Arm, Spencer Tracy in Bad Day at Black Rock. The winner is Ernest yeah! Borgnine. I just want to thank my mother for giving me the idea
going in and doing this, getting into this wonderful profession. My pop for being steadfast. Wow, what an amazing story. Now, over the next 10 years, he appeared in so many movies that it would take all day to list them all, and we're not going to do that. He would also appear on television shows here and there, but nothing ever, you know, reoccurring. Now, one day his agent called him and said, did you look over that script for this TV show called McHale's Navy? They think you'd be perfect for the part. And he goes, well, you know, I like it in the Navy, but, I, you know, I'm sticking to films. I can't commit to a television show. It's just not for me. And he goes, all right, I'll tell him. Now he says as soon as he hung up the phone and walked into the other room, his doorbell rang. He goes to the door and it's this teenage boy selling candy bars. And he starts talking to the kid and he's going to buy a couple candy bars. <laughs> and the kid goes, sir, you look really familiar. Are you on TV? And he thought, I'm going to play with this kid. And he goes... Yes, sir, I'm the star of Gunsmoke. And he goes, no, you're not. That's James Arnaz. And he goes, oh, wow, this kid knows his Gunsmoke. <laughs> and he goes, no, my name's really Richard Boone. And he goes, no, it's not. He plays on Have Gun, Will Travel. And he thought, man, this kid knows everything. He's real hip. And he goes, well, come on in here. Don't let these candy bars melt. I'm going to buy a bunch of them. And he goes, I thought, I'm going to show him some of my awards. And he goes, my name's really Ernest Borgnine. And the kid was just like, huh? And he goes, yes. And I've played in this movie and this. He goes, I have some memorabilia around the house. And the kid's like, yeah, I've not seen any of this stuff. But you do look familiar. And he goes, oh, okay. And so he bought a bunch of candy bars. And as soon as the kid left, he called his agent back up. And he says, is that part still available? And he goes, well, I'm sure it is. We, you know, I haven't even called him back yet. And he goes, tell him I'll take it. And he goes, well, what changed your mind? He says, none of your business. So he signed on to play Lieutenant Commander Quentin McHale on McHale's Navy. And the show ran for four seasons, 138 episodes. And it all started because he wanted to be relevant to the young crowd. He said he loves getting recognized. Now you'd seen him play a bad guy many times. Then the dramatic role of Marty. Well, this was pure comedy here. <laughs> and he had a young Tim Conway who was like his counterpoint, and they would play off of each other really good, along with Joe Flynn and the rest of the cast. It just worked, and it was funny. And that's why I'm making this video, because this is where I knew him from the most. Now, after McHale's Navy, he appeared in a hundred more things. I'm going to tell you this story. He says that Michael Landon called him one day and said, I'd love for you to be on Little House on the Prairie. And he said, I got the perfect script for you. And he goes, all right, we'll send it on over. I'll check it out. He said he's reading through it. And he's thinking, man, this is just too mushy and gushy. And then Michael calls him back and goes, well, what'd you think about it? And he goes, you know, I don't think I'm the right person for it. And he goes, no, you are. You're the perfect person because you are who I envisioned when I wrote the story, The Man in the Mountain. You are the man in the mountain. And he's like, oh, well, how can I say no to that? So I said, sure, I'll do it. And he goes, you know, we show up and we film for a couple days. And then one day, um, Michael Landon takes the whole cast out to lunch. And we're in Northern California on location. And we go into his little town and we're eating at a family diner. And afterward, everybody walks next door to this little antique store. And we're walking around in there. And I noticed this American flag in a case. And it says, it was flown at the Mare Island Naval Yard. And I go, wow, I was in the Mare Island Naval Yard on a ship for a while in the Navy. And, and everybody's like, oh, wow, that's cool. And he goes, man, that flag was there. And, you know, he said, when, we went back and we were filming for the rest of the week. And when we had a um, rap party at the end of the week and we all got to have a big get together, he presented me with that flag. Michael Landon had went back and bought it for me. And he goes, I take it home and I unfold it. And he goes, this is the one that's flown in the naval yard. And it's huge. He goes, but I flew it at my house and I did it a whole bunch of times. And I still do on occasion. He said, it's gigantic. He said, boy, did Michael know what was good for that show. 
That episode, The Man on the Mountain, became one of the most beloved Little House on the Prairie episodes ever. He said, every place I would go for the longest time, people would come up to me and say, we loved you on there. You're the man in the mountain. And he goes, I get a kick out of that no matter what role they remember me from. It's just a pleasure to meet these people. He goes, I've been with other actors and they disliked that. And he goes, I couldn't go in public with them because if you weren't going to be nice to the fans, I wasn't going to hang out with you. And he goes, one time we were filming a movie and we had to leave one location and drive through the city to another location. And I'm riding in there with these other two actors and one of them was just complaining about everything and blah, 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 this is wrong. I can't believe we have to drive all the way across town and blah, blah, blah. And the other one was saying, talking about wanting to be only filmed from one side and they won't listen to his direction. And he goes, he stopped at a stoplight. He says, I'm driving. <laughs> I look out the window and I see these guys and they're city workers and they're digging down for a water main thing. It's they're down in a hole with shovels. And I, I look and I go, we're getting paid $17,000 a day. Those guys are trying to make $100. They're digging a ditch. And if we get out of our car right now, they will want to run over and shake our hand. What do you have to complain about? We should be shaking their hands. We have it made. You guys got it all wrong. He said it didn't go over too good. But... I have to plant the seeds when I can. Now, Ernest continued working all the way until his death on July 8th, 2012 at the age of 95. Now, one of his final roles was that of Mermaid Man on SpongeBob, and his sidekick, Barnacle Boy, was played by Tim Conway. How cool is that? Ernest was also married five times and has four children. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please think about subscribing. I'm going to do some more characters from McHale's Navy, and you never know what you're going to get involved with when you start digging deep. This turned out to be more of a story time, but I hope you enjoyed the clips. Take care. Think about subscribing. Cool classics.